everyone. I am Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Change Catalyst and author of How to Be an Ally. I'm your host of Leading with Empathy and Allyship. Welcome. Allyship is about learning, showing empathy, and taking action. That process often includes learning, unlearning, and relearning, then building empathy for people with different experiences, and above all, taking consistent action. So each week, we'll learn from somebody new. Please be open to new ways of thinking and understanding. You can learn more about my work and sign up to join us for a live recording at ally.cc. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Nick Alm, founder and CEO of Mosier, a social enterprise with a mission of employment equity for everyone LGBTQ. Today, we'll be discussing how to design workplaces that celebrate and support LGBTQIA plus team members, and we'll focus on some key trends Mosier is finding as it works with organizations to drive LGBTQ inclusion and equity. And we'll also discuss some future trends as well. Welcome, Nick. Excited for you to be here. Hello, Melinda. So fabulous to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, so for our YouTube audience, would you join me first in describing ourselves for anybody who's blind or low vision? So yes. I, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'm happy to. I'm a white woman with long red and blonde hair. I'm wearing glasses and a bright orange shirt that kind of matches the book in my background, my How to Be an Ally book in my background with plants around it on one side. And then on the other side, I have a, a tall um, tall bookshelf that has uh, books from different folks who have joined us over the last uh, two and a half, almost three years. Cool. Uh, my name is Nick Gaum. I use they, them pronouns. I have lime green hair and kind of a bit of a mullet that I'm I'm trying to grow out. It's at my shoulders right now, but we're trying to take it further. Um, I've got a suit on right now. I've got my navy turtleneck, navy checkered suit. You can't see this right now, but I, I'm six foot three in real life and six foot seven if I've got my heels on. I could check the white box if I'm asked about my race. Um, got some nail polish on, a, a black red nail polish. And I think those are the big things. Awesome. Thank you. And also today, we're joined by our ASL interpreters, Andrea and Haley, from our incredible partners at Interpreter Now. And you can learn more about them at interpreter-now.com. So Nick, let's talk about your story first. Where, where did you grow up and what was your path to the work that you do now? Yeah. So I grew up in Stillwater, Minnesota, the birthplace of Minnesota. That was where all the lumberjacks lived and did their thing way back in the 1800s and the logging and all the things. Not super important to my story. But I was one of two openly queer kids in a class of about 700 people uh, in Stillwater, Minnesota. And throughout this conversation today, I'm going to use the word queer. That's my preference. Um, I understand that folks from different generations might not feel so hot about that word. And we can talk about that. LGBTQ or LGBTQ plus is a, is a really acceptable acronym also that I uh, might use interchangeably. Two queer, one of two queer kids in Stillwater, Minnesota, I thought making it to college was going to be this liberatory, celebratory experience, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a music teacher, but I was the oldest in my family, right? I was newly out. I came out at 17. I was the first in my family to go to college. I had to do something notable and something important. So I went to business school, right? Forget being a music teacher because that's too fluffy and uh, <laughs> isn't going to pay the bills. So I go to business school and put it this way. I was built for entrepreneurship. I learned that right away. But um, what I realized is that there was a very strong message that the more you could act white, the more you could act straight, the more you could act like a man, the more you could essentially tone yourself down, um, the better chances you would, you would have of making it to the top in the business world. And that was really frustrating for me uh, because, again, I'm a gender nonconforming person. I'm wearing makeup and nail polish and all these things into my interviews. And people, these, these corporate recruiters from Fortune 500 companies, they really had no idea what to do with me. And one of my early inspirations or one of the one of the first moments I realized, oh, this is a big problem and a problem that I want to solve is when I would just simply ask recruiters, what is it like to be LGBTQ with your organization? 
I thought that was a totally appropriate question. And I wasn't met with intense homophobia or transphobia, but what I was met with was a lot of deer in the headlights type of looks. Mm -hmm. A lot of shocked people who really, right? Like they couldn't, they're like, wait, what did you just say? And you could tell they, in their repertoire, they had never been coached on this. This was in like 2014. So I thought we were for sure, you know, there. <laughs> right. Um, but we weren't. And so um, me and a few other folks who were also frustrated with the overall culture and environment, we decided to start an LGBT organization, the first student group that had ever existed in the business school at the University of Minnesota. And we had 150 people show up to the very first dinner that we threw. Mm -hmm. And it was, I'll never forget it because I, I just thought, oh, wow, there's tons of people who want to have this conversation. Nobody wanted to be the first to have the conversation. Nobody wanted to put themselves out there. And companies, mm -hmm. uh, after recognizing my leadership there, they asked me, Nick, can you come in and do a training for our recruiting department? Could you help us rewrite our transgender inclusion guidelines? The asks accumulated. And each one of those was like a little business light bulb. And five years ago, I started Mosier, my company, uh, with a mission of enabling employment equity for everyone LGBTQ. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm sure that parts of your story resonate with a lot of our listeners, actually. And so maybe you could then tell us a little bit about Mosier. What is it? What do you do so that we can kind of talk about uh, the trends you're seeing next? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's kind of the, there's a personal aspect, then there's the business aspect. And mm -hmm. from a personal standpoint, I got into this work to heal myself and other people, right? And, and mm -hmm. in many ways, um, this work starting Mosher was about trying to convince people that who I am is okay, because there were certain people in my life who I could not convince that, you know, I was normal or okay, right? As far as a, the actual business goes, uh, we do a variety of different things. We do an organizational assessment with companies. So we go under the hood. We look at policies, procedures, and a variety of compliance uh, dealios with regards to trans and non-binary inclusion, recruiting, self-identification, which if you're not familiar with that, that's how an organization asks you the either the candidate or the current employee about your lgbtq status employee resource groups and culture are the five areas mm. so we go and we we look at those we create a roadmap for organizations usually about a 12-month roadmap and we say here's what needs to happen if you want to either kind of hold your position as an employer of choice or if you want to get on the map with the lgbtq community um, we host monthly trainings and events open to the public for our member companies so that folks can continue to build capacities. We're, we're a big advocate from moving from compliance to capacity building mm -hmm. in this space right now, which we can talk about. And then lastly, we do uh, we have a recruiting platform. So if you're listening and you are an LGBTQ person, this is completely a free service. We, we have a job board. We have a resume database. And then we do free career coaching with job seekers. Uh, and then we will match them with open roles at our member companies. And basically, you know, just kind of help them get a leg up in the hiring process because we know that it's just kind of wrought with getting, getting a job, getting hired is confusing, even if you don't have overlapping identities that are marginalized. So mm -hmm. that's Mosher in a nutshell. Awesome. Uh, so... You create this mo roadmap uh, for companies, and uh, and you're starting to see some some trends, I assume, as a result mm -hmm. of that. So that's what we're going to spend most of our time on today. I think is is diving into what the, what those trends are and and where you're finding, I guess, the combination of of trends and recommendations. Right. That uh, maybe we start with trans and non-binary inclusion. What are you seeing? Um, what are where are the the challenges that that companies have, and the challenges that um, queer and uh, the trans and non-binary folks in particular have, and 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 then the second piece is, um, then we can talk about opportunities for doing it better. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I would say up until now, the 
when people think of trans inclusion in the workplace, the first initiative that would come to mind would be transgender inclusion guidelines or gender transition guidelines or playbooks. They go by a few different names. Part of that reason is the human rights campaign very smartly asks for that Mm -hmm. in their corporate equality index. Um, But here's the deal. Usually what has to happen at most companies is uh, for those guidelines to get created, a trans person or a non-binary person has to come forward and announce to everybody, hey, I am looking to transition. How do I do so? What are the medical benefits? Can I get any sort of leave? Are there medical providers in my geography where my office is, where I can you know, get support? It, these brave individuals have to kind of shatter every rainbow ceiling there mm. is um, for companies to realize, oh, we should, we should publish these. When we actually do get around to writing those guidelines, though, what we end up with most of the time is a very rigid document. Um, and I get it because human resources, right, there's a lot of box checking that we have to do. There's legal and compliance things to worry about. But these guidelines, what they, what they do is they essentially the insinuation is this, they say this is the one way to transition and you must transition this way. Mm. Um, and then only by transitioning this way will you uh, not be seen as inconveniencing the larger organization. And if you fall outside of these guidelines, well, then kind of you're on your own. Because in many cases, even after those guidelines are created, the folks in HR who need to be fielding questions about them Oftentimes, they have not been given those uh, that training and development on trend right. inclusion or the sensitivities around that. So that's the big thing. The other quick thing I'll say that I'm seeing a lot, this is kind of my, my recommendation moving forward. And what I'm seeing as a problem and an opportunity is the normalization of pronoun use at organizations. Um, I'm happy to report that from what I can see, there's a lot of momentum around this. And I think in part because it's it's a very tactical and simple step in many ways to just add pronouns to your email signature, to your Zoom signature, add it to an employee directory. But what it's what I'm seeing is that pronouns are the most efficient tool we have to open the conversation about gender identity and gender expression at work. Why would somebody use they them pronouns? Well, they might identify as non-binary. Well, what is non-binary? It just it opens up a whole bunch of other conversations. And a couple of years ago, I might have come on this podcast and, sa- and said something like, hmm, I don't I don't know if it's going to stick around, if the pronoun thing is really going to, if it's going to be more of a niche thing that only certain folks take seriously, or if it's going to be this, you know, broadly mass adopted initiative. And it has shown we've se- I've seen that this is something that is here to stay, um, not a superfluous DEI initiative at all. So yeah, those would be the two things I would pull out right away. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of pronouns, I, I'm seeing that too. We're definitely more and more people are. It it was you know a couple of years ago. I think more the activists, the advocates, the DEI folks, the sometimes folks in HR who were um, really focused on on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it was it's mostly the people doing it every day, and and mm-hmm. the trans folks that were out and felt um, safe to do so. Um, the nine binary folks that felt safe to do so. And now it's definitely, I'm seeing a, a shift, which is great. And, and, and I think the shift will continue. I'll, I want to share a little story that um, one of, I, I do inclusive leadership coaching. And one of my coaching clients, who's uh, an executive, he decided to discuss using pronouns regularly with the leadership team. And, and he, you know, he had, he prepared a little talk and he, and he talked about why and, and he asked everybody to put their pronouns in the Zoom signatures and in their emails. And it was, he thought it was just a simple thing that he could do as an ally. And after a discussion, he had to field some questions. The whole leadership team decided to, to adopt the practice and showed up at the next all hands, all with their pronouns in their names um, in Zoom. And someone noted it in the call and they talked a little bit about why. And then at the next all hands, about 75% of the companies put their pronouns in their Zoom signature. And then the next all hands, it was even greater. So, I mean, it doesn't take much. That started with a conversation and just a couple more conversations and suddenly it was adopted. And the 
a lead from the LGBTQIA plus ERG said afterwards, came back to that executive and told him how important that was to them, that that um, that increased psychological safety and belonging. Just that act, that the very simple act can create quite a bit of change. Mm. And it does, it, it does, as you, as you mentioned, is, there's more to it. There's a conversation around why there's a conversation about that, that sometimes is important to have. And um, you start to create that space for the conversation by simply doing, taking that one step. Mm. Yeah. Makes my day to hear that. That's such a great story. Yeah. I also want to, want to go back a little bit to the handbooks, the manuals around transitioning too, that I, one of the things that I have seen that some companies take it to the next level that yes, there's that compliance, there's the benefits, there's um, that piece of it. And that can become prescriptive, as you said, if you're not careful. The other piece of that that you, you, you can mention in there is the training and development The as a manager, how do I support as what, mm. and then as a team, how do I shift not the language that I might be using? How do I shift the way I'm thinking as well? That that piece of it is is really key to really fundamentally creating a safe space and a, a place where somebody can actually feel they belong. Yeah, I, I saw some guidelines that I really liked recently, and they included a lot of scenario planning, like mm. kind of those if-then situations. Okay, so my trans colleague, uh, someone has an issue with them using this bathroom. Like, how do I have that conversation with both the trans person and the person who is not wanting them to use that bathroom? How do I correct somebody respectfully mm. if they use the wrong pronoun or the wrong name? I think that's the next big thing is like, mm -hmm. can your culture, do we see each, ourselves as allies enough? And are we comfortable with each other enough where I can say, oh, hey, Melinda, actually, so-and-so uses she, her pronouns, not he, him pronouns. And is mm -hmm. Melinda going to crumble in that moment? And is it going to blow up the whole meeting? Or is it going to be just a part of regular day-to-day -day business and say, okay, cool, got it, thank you, my bad. I'll fix that moving forward. Yeah. That's really mm -hmm. the, the next piece. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then just another another quick story. I was talking with a, an ERG lead, um, Pride ERG in a, in a larger company, and they were telling me they were so excited. They saw that there was a new handbook created and... And then, and they read it and it was like, oh, this is really, a, 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 you know, nicely done. There's some great things in there I wouldn't have expected. And then she realized, wait a minute, there's no plan to roll this out. There's no accountability embedded in this. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to. So you also need that rollout plan. You need that, how, you know, how are you going to take the next step and actually work with managers, work with leaders to, to make that happen? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Totally. I mean. As a new employee, am I getting this in onboarding? Like, right. am I, when I get promote, like, when is this made available to me? A lot, of, yeah. So many clients, I'm like, I'm like, they'll come. To, people will come to me and say, my company doesn't have guidelines, and I'm like, no, your company does have guidelines. Like, I I've talked to the HR person, and but they just didn't get the memo, and I'm like, how do I know as a consultant, mm. but you don't know as right. the employee? So, right, right, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's the communication as well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, we've we we've talked about trans and non-binary inclusion some and some some things that you can think about um, inside your team inside your organization. What about ERGs? What are you seeing there? Yeah. So the big thing I'm seeing is ERG burnout. ERG. Mm. Um, you know. It, it was funny when, we, so we have our five areas that we score, right? And uh, I believe I want to check the data to make sure I'm not lying here, but the employee resource group, yes, out of all the five areas that we measure companies, our company scored the highest in the employee resource group section. Mm -hmm. And I that said, makes... okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go. <laughs> I was just going to say, maybe it, does... it makes sense because ERGs have kind of been traditionally seen as... It was the first step in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a lot of them have been around a lot longer. Maybe, maybe that's one piece. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's a tangible part that has been around. I mean, since you know the sixties or maybe mm -hmm. before that. Um, so what I see though too, the reason companies have scored so high is because you have these 
LGBTQ folks who are putting everything on the line to run mm-hmm. them well. Um, mm-hmm. They're unpaid. Most of the companies I see, they don't have um, folks on their DEI team or folks in HR who are tasked with supporting employee resource groups from an administrative standpoint. Mm-hmm. So they're taking all of that on themselves. And I can tell you from experience, from start, you know, starting an LGBT group, there's being out at work and then there's running an employee resource group. <laughs> Uh, there is having this spotlight shined on you, right? This expectation that you're going to be a spokesperson for the entire community. Um, mm-hmm. And this expectation, you know, you're for so many folks at your company, you might be the first out employee that they've ever actually talked to, right? So there, I, it, it breaks my heart to see how many ERG leaders, you know, they take that so seriously, which is good. Um, mm-hmm. But they're so hard on themselves and they're so... They feel so pressured by that responsibility in addition to their day jobs. And so ERGs, ERG leads, they make it a year, they maybe make it two. And then mm-hmm. they go away and they leave all of that, all that institutional knowledge, all of that information about how the ERG got to where it is, that leaves with them. And so there's this boom and bust cycle that I see with employee resource groups. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of the biggest thing that emerged from our data and storytelling. Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk about some ways to address that? Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's kind of a few different things. Um, number one, I think the timing of this is great because as companies, as we enter kind of this this next year here, things are going to get very interesting from a hiring standpoint. Companies are obviously might gonna they're going to pull back a little, but I think a lot of companies, based on what I'm reading, you know, they want to hang on to their employees. And so the question of the next year, I think, is going to be around employee engagement and how do you Mm. retain people um, because companies just spend so much time and time and money hiring folks in this tough environment. They don't want to let them go if the economy, you know, takes off again after this little dip that we're going to hit. So we need to kind of do two things at the same time. We need to incentivize ERG membership. And the ways you incentivize the ERG membership, uh, number one, uh, your executives, like your story, Melinda, executives and important people at the company, they need to be involved in the ERG as well. And involved as in like attending the events, asking questions at the events, getting themselves involved. If ERGs aren't seen as a place where people can go to advance their career and be seen in addition to creating that community and psychological safety, you're going to have a really hard time sustaining that ERG long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second thing is um, there's about five, I think five percent, and I don't know if that's a, if that's Fortune 500 companies or Fortune 1000, but about five percent of companies that have employee resource groups actually compensate their employee resource group leaders. Wow, it's and that low. I didn't it's know that. that low. Oof. I. Right. And, and the, and the ones that are compensated, it ranges from, I've seen as much as $10,000 for an ERG lead down to, you know, a thousand dollars or a few mm-hmm. hundred dollars. Okay. Um, I think it's so important that either that there is paid staff who are supporting ERGs or that those, and, or preferably mm-hmm. in hand, those ERGs are compensated because what it does is it says you send a message when you force people to do that much unpaid work you send a message that one dei is elective and nice to have and volunteer based and right woo woo and Mm -hmm. fluffy and you know that's the the subtle message i think you know if that person is a person of color who's running that erg then we are into a whole another arena of just messy ethical you know requiring people of color to do unpaid labor and replicating that cycle again that Mm -hmm. kind of exists in this country um, of expecting people of color to work for free again we can maybe tolerate it for a year but not much more than that so those would be the big things i would say you know we need to together could strengthen ERGs for the long term yeah i've seen one other thing comes to mind that that some companies may not compensate separately for ergs but they do a a lot, like 20% of their time is dedicated to ERGs. And that 20%, the, the key part of this is that it has to be real. Like that 20% needs to be taken off of their, their daily workload. 
Um, and that, that could be another way to address it. If you really can't compensate, you know, it's another way to address it, but it has to be real. You have to really do that and work with the managers to reduce that workload. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, And that same trend that you're seeing there around burnout also happens with DEI leaders as well. There's the burnout. It's a little bit longer of a cycle uh, of because of somebody's full-time job, perhaps they stick around longer, but but there is a, a burnout cycle that happens also in DEI leads as well. Um, because the, the the work can be really toxic from time to time. You, you know, if you're there for somebody who's coming out and if and if you're really open to that, that uh, that is emotional labor as well as cognitive labor of creating the strategy around it and so on. So um there is there is a real need to address that and um you know offering the the opportunity for mental health services and all of that is really important too as well as just taking taking your time off um um sometimes you know when when we're really passionate about our work um and it's an extra add-on to our daily work we don't take the time off we use the time off to to further the erg work right and we really need to take that time off to regenerate Uh. yeah yeah, even just the one thing I'll say quick it, for leaders is just the acknowledgement of what Melinda you just said is just telling that DEI leader, that ERG leader, hey, thank you for yeah. your service. And I recognize that mm. because of the identities that you possess, this is a different kind of work and it involves that emotional piece and that spiritual piece for a lot of people. The reason we mm. do this work has got a deeper, bigger purpose to it. And it just just saying, I see that. I think that that's not compensation, but just being seen in that way could go so long. So I'll just throw that in there if you're a leader. That's, that's one quick great, thing you could do. Great point. Great point. Uh, and one thing I would just want to let our listeners and watchers know is it, we talked about um, ARG specifically for LGBTQIA plus folks in episode 89 as well. So if this is something you're interested, go have a listen or watch to creating psychologically safe workplaces for LGBTQIA plus folks. All right. So um, maybe we jump into recruiting. I know that is something that a lot of companies have focused on, you know, you focus on ERGs, that you focus on recruiting, and then eventually we get to culture in most um, organizations. So let's talk about recruiting next. Obviously, it's important for a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. What are you finding? Mm-hmm. So, Melinda, I am totally shocked that we've gone all this time, and there are I don't there's no data that I can cite here, but I know it's in the single digits percentage wise in terms of the companies that actually track the number of LGBTQ applicants that are coming to their job openings. Mm. And part of this reason is the the self-ID conversation. I'm I'm kind of blending two here, but the self-identification conversation has largely focused on current employees' internal HR system. And of the 1,200 companies that take the Human Rights Campaign Corporate Equality Index, I think about 46% of those companies have an internal self-ID method. So we're not even halfway there on current employees. But I always tell, you know, when people pay me, right, to come in and help them attract more LGBT folks to their organization, like, how are we actually going to measure that? Um, You're spending all this money on career fairs, student group partnerships, sponsorships. Is that providing any sort of real lift in the Mm -hmm. number of employees? And where in the process from, you know, interviewing, to onboarding, are folks not making it, right? Uh, because I talk to candidates all the time who, an LGBT person of color, for example, who does really great in the phone screen, but when a video call or an in-person call comes up in round two or round three, and someone realizes that they're not white, the tone changes. Mm-hmm. I Things change drastically, for example, if you're trans and you're going through the process, and then uh, questions get asked down the line about, you know, why your name on your resume doesn't match the name that you have, your legal name that you inputted into the applicant tracker system, right? Because many companies aren't asking for both legal name and chosen name. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say chosen name, it's not a preferred name. Um, right. And I don't use the term preferred pronouns either. It's just chosen name and pronouns. So recruiting is not set up to take this conversation seriously. A lot of companies are just spending money 
in order to feel good that they are maybe getting some LGBT eyeballs on their positions. Mm -hmm. Um, So we need to have self-ID in recruiting. Uh, Goldman Sachs, there's a Fortune article, if you Google, they've done it. And there's a great case study online. I'm telling my clients that if the Equality Act were to pass, which has passed the House now, I believe twice, if we could get that done, companies over 100 employees are going to be required to ask sexual orientation and gender identity and report that to the federal government. So I'm like, it's coming. So Mm -hmm. you might as well get it done. But a lot of legal departments, they're like, "Mm, if we don't need to collect it, we don't want to have an extra set of data that could be used in some very obscure situation that could discriminate and have that come back. And, you know, so Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a big thing I see um, companies struggling with right now. Yeah, and 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 of course, it it um, in different parts of the world, um, you can't ask those questions too, and it's really important not to ask those questions in some parts of the world too. So, uh, global companies are also reckoning with with that. What do we do differently in the U.S. and and some other parts of the the world than than in others? Um, and that is an important consideration that. Um, because in in some areas of the world mm-hmm. you document it, that's that is unsafe too. Yeah, and and you mentioned along the way some um, areas where people can improve um, on their reporting, on uh, self ID, and also on identifying their uh, their chosen name. And and uh, are there other things that you can suggest? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, if you're just getting started. I would keep it really simple. All you really need is a question on your your applicant, your job seeker fills out that says, you know, do you identify as a member of the LGBTQ plus community? Yes, no, prefer not to say. And I would just leave it at that right up front. Hmm. You know, eventually we'd love to see a question that says, you know, what is your gender identity and providing man, woman, non-binary, transgender, et cetera. Gender queer is the other really big one that I'm seeing. Um, and then sexual orientation being lesbian, gay, bisexual, right? Asexual. I'm seeing more and more um, queer is a, is a term for both gender identity and sexual orientation. I see uh, that's used more, but keep it simple in the beginning. You just, <laughs> your goal initially is just get something statistically significant to begin to tell some kind of story. Um, so, and then from there, really the end game of all of this is goal setting and accountability. If there isn't a mandate for the talent acquisition team that we want to increase the number of people coming into this organization who are LGBTQ by this percentage, and here's what's going to happen if it doesn't work out, right? And that's not a, that's not a, thre- it's not meant to sound threatening, right? But companies just say, this is the, the if then. If we don't hit that, then what do we need to change? If mm-hmm. those conversations aren't happening and that's not in place, you know, you're really spinning your tires at that point. So, It's end game's accountability. The end game is also what I really would love to see moving forward. I don't know if this is going to happen in the near future, but companies sharing publicly this data and, you know, Google and a lot of tech tech companies, Google, I think started in 2014. You can go, they've got an amazing dashboard with all Mm -hmm. their uh, DEI metrics, no LGBTQ metrics at all though. Um, yeah. Right. So I want to, I'd love to see that shared publicly and to produce, you know, friendly competition among all these companies to see who can get to the 7.1% of the total US population that identifies the LGBTQ and the 20% of Generation mm-hmm. Z that is identifying as queer. So most companies right. haven't cracked 2% yet from what I've seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And part of that is creating the psychologically safe space for people to come out and identify, <laughs> even when it's anonymous. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. I. How do I, uh, the other, the big recommendation for recruiting, this is something much smaller that you can do today. I, I'm shocked by how many companies don't have an LGBTQ specific page on your website, talking about mm-hmm. your employee resource group, talking about your benefits, right? If my rule is, as a queer job seeker, if I can't find that information on your website in under three clicks, mm-hmm. right, I'm way less likely to self-ID. I'm way less likely to be out in the hiring process, period. So 
that is so easy to fix. And if you can get if you can get like video testimonial from current LGBTQ employees, that's like gold standard. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see more of that. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, the photographs that it's the words and the photographs that really show that yeah. it, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I know. Right. Yeah, not a little like icon and the little stick figure. Like Yeah. 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 Um, I, I know we've kind of touched on culture in different pieces here too. Is there anything in addition that we didn't touch on around culture that um that you're finding that we should talk about? Yeah, I, I want to make sure I call out the next year is gonna be really challenging when it comes to mm-hmm. the political environment. Um, we're going to get a landmark Supreme Court case decision in June um, coming out of Colorado focused on whether or not I, as a business owner, could refuse service to somebody who is LGBTQ um, based on, this is a, it's not a religious freedom uh, argument, it's a free speech argument that's being made. You should re- definitely read about that. It's not looking good for uh, pro-equity, pro-equality folks, okay? Um, so we have that on the horizon. We have, we're going to have a crowded uh, GOP nomination field, right? Yes. With a group of people who are going to make a competition out of who can be the biggest bully, specifically to trans people, right? Mm. And I don't, I hate to get political, but the reality is um, a culture that can't survive discussions about politics at work um, is not going to be a future looking company. Mm-hmm. Me as a Gen Z queer job seeker, that's probably the barometer that I'm going to look at now uh, when I'm uh, going to ask for a job is, has this company spoken out publicly about any of the 124 this year introduced pieces of anti-LGBT legislation? We had 280 something This is the ACLU data. We had 280-something last year. We're already at 124. Companies that don't speak out about it, don't take a stance on it, don't create the space within their organization to have a discussion about how it's impacting employees, that is going to be table stakes now. Mm -hmm. Millennials getting 100 on the Corporate Equality Index for the Human Rights Campaign, that was maybe, that was the, the gold standard. For Gen Z, when I talk to them, getting 100 is box number one. And they want to be a part of a culture where they can show up and say, you know what, X, Y, Z, the fact that my state is banning gender affirming care for trans people is impacting my mental health. It's impacting my decision to want to work in this office or state or with this company. If we're opening up a new office in one of these states, I should feel comfortable enough to challenge that or ask why or ask if there was a consideration that was made to the Mm -hmm. how that political environment will impact employees. So many companies are still in the we can't talk about politics at work mindset. Yeah. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And I understand that. But it's just we're going to reach a fever pitch this year. I'm predicting that is going to be impossible to ignore. So it's kind of an ignore it at your own peril situation um, Mm -hmm. right now. You just there's no way to get around it. Businesses through the most some of the most we have surveys saying that uh, U.S. citizens trust business you know, more than government, more than so many other institutions, right? So it's like businesses, now that we've gutted the human rights apparatus of the government, businesses are expected to fill that void. So are we going to pick up that mantle or are we going to, you know, lob the the ball back over the net, you know, so to speak? Mm -hmm. So a big opportunity if your company wants to differentiate yourself on that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and the, and and there's lots of different ways that you can work on that. I, you know, in every culture, company culture is different. So if you if you've banned political discussions, it's gonna you know you have, bringing them back is is something that you have to do strategically, carefully, and with training, with coaching, perhaps with some outside um, help to help to to really help create those safe spaces for those conversations. Um, it, it, you know, as the as the uh, we go into the presidential election too, there's there's going to be a lot of um, politics on people's minds, and whether we ban those conversations or not, it works our way. It works its way into the workplace. That is totally the point I always make. It's like you either do it and have some control over it, or mm-hmm. you allow this to potentially go sideways, or have people duke it out on social media, or 
you know, you would much rather as a company from a risk management standpoint, I think, get out ahead of it, create the safe space. You don't need to have the whole, all 10,000 people on one call for the first <laughs> discussion, <laughs> but it, it can just be, just to be a few small listening sessions to get it going and start to, you know, mm-hmm. it to start small, it to, but you got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other uh, trends you're thinking about or it can, what you're thinking about in terms of the future and, and the next stage of, of companies really working to address LGBTQI plus inclusion? And equity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, some other things I would say. I think we're we're getting to an interesting point in DEI in general, where the box checking days are kind of over because so many mm. companies have checked all the boxes as it relates to having the right policies, having the right benefits, etc. The next phase is going to be much more time consuming and much more expensive. And I'll use the pronoun thing, for example, because we kind of touched on it already. You're right. There's, it's one thing to get an employee directory set up where everybody can self ID their pronouns. It's a completely different situation where you have everybody on a team meeting. When they start the call, they say, Hi, I'm Nick, and my pronouns are they and them. Mm. Getting everybody to that point is going to require much more education, much more capacity building, transgender and non binary issues in general, right? I think we're at a point where. Everyone's just kind of going along with it because it feels like this is what we're supposed to say. And you've got a lot of people who are reading off a script when it comes to these issues. And people, many people are still visibly uncomfortable, you know, talking to trans and non-binary people, recruiters in these interviews, visibly uncomfortable, visibly. I can read the energy right off of you if it's obvious that you haven't interacted with LGBTQ people much. Hmm. That doesn't make you a bad person. But that is the next thing we have to think about is how do we give folks more exposure? How do we get folks to a point where they have enough working knowledge to start to solve these issues on their own without me, the consultant, coming in to say, do this, not that. I would love to start more of those conversations around, um, like in my trainings, people are always like, people want binary answers to everything. You know, Mm. Nick, how do we, how do I deal with this person who doesn't want me to use the bathroom? Like, tell me the right answer. And I'm like, folks, like non-binary thinking is the future. I can't (laughs) tell you that there's one way to do any of this, right? I'm a big believer in non-binary thinking. I'm a big believer in breaking down this us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a big believer in breaking down this zero-sum game mentality that exists in DEI right now and in LGBTQ inclusion, especially because we've got gay white men who have got one experience we've got black lesbian women who have a completely different experience and we need to look at those intersections we need to start to recognize that lgbtq people are not a monolith the experience again like i said could vary drastically we have a bisexual community that is still completely invisible to Mm -hmm. most (laughs) companies even though they represent like 40 some percent of the total lgbtq pie so intersectionality non-binary thinking, capacity building, giving people the the skills and strategies to think critically through these issues as opposed to needing to look at a, a how-to guide or look at a textbook. That's the future for LGBTQ inclusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of those super important. Thank you for that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was, I, I was thinking about the um, more exposure and, and the a lot of the workshops that I lead, the leadership workshops that I lead, the um, even even when I come in and do a keynote at a company, I'm often the first person that's talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the company, uh, it, it, which blows my mind in and of itself. We're 2023, and glad we're doing it. And mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the the a lot of the folks that I'm working with have never had exposure. Like you said, that expose, you know, we grow up and some of my coaching clients too, they they've grown up in white middle to upper class suburbs and gone to schools that were um mostly people exactly like them and and they just haven't had that exposure. They don't know what they don't know either. And so you know that that work is is really important. That breaking breaking down of the the fear of um, of, of knowing of learning um, is a piece of it, and creating that space for people to learn. And I think a lot of it 
a lot of it can be through ERGs where, you know, open up some of your events to allies, um, to people that want to, and, and not even to allies, you know, some people are just kind of at the observer stage. They're not ready to take action yet. So open it up to the whole company um, and and have those conversations where people really get a chance to learn somebody's unique experiences in a way that they never would have otherwise had that exposure. Yeah, that and and then the 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 empathy building conversations too. I I see how quickly people can change when they just are in a room with somebody that they've never uh, somebody from an identity that they've never really talked with before, and they start to have a conversation about identity identity and what what they care about, what they don't care about, and all of that stuff. And so quickly you can build a relationship with somebody that you would never have in another situation. Um, and that, that too, those, those kind of impromptu conversations, those, those conversations to really get to know each other one-on-one can be really powerful too. Yeah. Yeah. I just went down a rabbit hole on rotational programs for like internships and how mm. they can, you know, moving interns around or really this entry-level employees or any group of employees, moving them around to different managers and giving managers access and exposure to different, oftentimes those entry-level people are the most diverse um mm. we're all diverse but you know you know what i mean by that racially diverse etc yeah. um yeah, yeah. yeah i mean looking for yeah. the opportunity like you just there's small ways to just increase exposure and exposure really is i think the most powerful tool to just like breaking down that us versus them and that internalized unconscious fear or bias mm-hmm mm-hmm Fantastic. Um, uh, so um, I have two questions left. They're both quick ones. Well, the second one yeah. is quick. The first one <laughs> may not be. Uh, th- this show and this work we do is about getting people to, you know, giving people things to think about, ways to take action. As, and and so I wanted to ask you, what action would you like somebody to take after listening or watching this episode with us? Hmm. Yeah, great question. I would, if I were you, I would look at what is your state legislature doing right now, positive or negative, right? I'm in Minnesota, where we have a we have a Democratic controlled House, Senate, and Governor, um, and we're going to hopefully be doing some great things around banning conversion therapy um, and some other things, expanding access to trans affirming healthcare. Look at what your state's doing. Become familiar with that conversation. Become it's the best barometer you have for the kind of undercurrent of how people feel in your locality about LGBTQ people. Those are the attitudes and things that are going to be seeping into your workplace. Um, those are the things that your LGBTQ employees are certainly watching. So, you know, even if you can be that, that manager, that person who says to an LGBTQ colleague, you know, Hey, I'm hope you're doing all right. I'm really, you know, frustrated by what's happening, right? Bring it up before they even have to talk about it. Um, seeing them in that moment, you know, those those are small things you can do right now that can have an impact. And we got to be alert because there are people who are homophobic and transphobic. And I don't just say conservative people because it's liberal people too. There's we're finding all these kind of creative ways to erase specifically trans people from public life. I mean, that is really the campaign that's happening. So um, mm. stay alert and stay woke about that. Mm, awesome. Yeah. And 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 uh, so last question, because um, we're mm-hmm. running out of time, is where can people learn more about your work? Yes. So my company's name is Mosier. That's Amazon Mary, O-S-S-I-E-R.com. You can go there and the right side, you can sign up. Uh, again, all of our job seeker resources and opportunities are completely free. We have individual memberships, right? We have public events that we do. Those will be starting up again this year. Um, those public events range from we've done trans inclusive healthcare benefits. We've done a self ID talk. We've done, we did a burnout session for ERG leaders. And every month is kind of a, we try to keep folks on the cutting edge of the conversation. Um, our blog is really helpful too. So, uh, we've got free resources there on pronouns. If you're an LGBTQ person and you want to know what kind of questions you can ask in an interview, uh, mm-hmm. we've got a guide for that, among other things. It's totally available. 
And then the subscribe button is uh, towards the bottom of the the website. You know, we send out monthly best practices and tips and um, would love to see you at a, at a Mojo engagement here in the near future. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we will put that link in our show notes at ally.cc. And we'll also include a couple, we'll also include a couple of other episodes if you want to go deeper into some. I, I mentioned episode 89, also episode 84 on the radical act of choosing common ground to create change. I think, you know, for those folks who are looking to create those internal conversations, that might be a good good um, one to look at to finding common ground when we can feel so um, polarized right now. So thank you, Nick, so much for this conversation. Thanks, Melinda, for having me. Super fun. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all for listening or watching and see you next week, everyone. We'll share resources and a transcript from this discussion at ally.cc. And please make sure to subscribe to our channel and rate this show. It makes a difference for us. Thank you for being part of our community. And remember, the more we take action, the more we grow as humans and as leaders, and the more we transform our communities. So what action will you take today? Let us know your actions by emailing podcast at changecatalyst.co or reaching out on social media. And Leading with Empathy and Allyship is a show by Change Catalyst where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. You can learn more about us at changecatalyst.co. So let's keep building allyship across our communities and around the world. Thank you for listening.